Uh, so the first one uh, I'm going to show you is a, a piece of literature, great 20th century literature that's highly relevant to the communication complexity interactive communication problem. Um, um, that, um, as far as I know, the connection was unnoticed until uh, about, about a year ago. Um, so this piece of literature is from the famous Calvin and Hobbes comic strip, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the comic strip. Um, so those of you who don't know the series should immediately go out and buy the collection. So this is Calvin uh, calling the uh, county, I don't know if you can read it, the things are a little, maybe actually, well this, just for this, the other one. Yeah, okay, just, just for this, I can turn on the light if you like later, but just so this you can see better because it's a little dim. Um, so Calvin's calling uh, the county library, the uh, reference desk please, hello, yes, I, I need a word definition. And um, the librarian responds and then Calvin says, uh, well, you see, well that's the problem, I don't know how to spell it and I'm not allowed to say it. Um, and, then, and then Calvin says, uh, could, could you please, to the librarian, could you please just rattle off all of the swear words that you know? And, and I'll stop you when you, uh, hello, hello? And see if I ever vote for, for them again. Um, okay, so this is, this is Calvin, um, this is a Calvin and Hobbes uh, um, cartoon. And uh, let, let's put it in our framework, okay? So, um, so here's the sensible protocol that Calvin would have liked to be performing. Um, so there's a series of vertices called uh, words, and then the, and the, there's another series of vertices which, which have their definitions attached. And the, the sensible protocol for looking up the spelling of, of some word is you say the, the curse word that you'd like to say darn, and then the librarian responds with the word, def with the definition. Clearly it's communication that's the efficient way to do this in terms of communication. So the librarian responds with the definition of this curse word, which is to mend a hole in fabric by weaving a yarn across it. Um, uh, at which point Calvin gets frustrated, no, that's not what I meant, and so forth. Okay, so, so this, is the, this is the sensible protocol. It's a two-round protocol, of course. And um, the, um, unfortunately, there's another protocol which Calvin is sort of being forced to employ, which is the one-round protocol, where the librarian sort of gives them definitions of all possible curse words. And that's communication-wise much less efficient, which is sort of part of the humor of the, of the strip. So this uh, comic strip, I think, predates um, uh, this theorem, um, which for some reason, uh, which is sort of a little bit, which, which I think didn't get mentioned in any, any of the uh, talks that we had this week, maybe I missed it, uh, but it's kind of essential to why computer scientists care about uh, round complexity in, in communications, and it's, and it's essential to the whole issue of, of you know, why this interactive coding theorem is, is challenging in the first place, why it doesn't just reduce to classical. So that was mentioned many times, but there's a theorem that formalizes that. And the theorem uh, says that uh, for all k greater equal to, so k here is the number of rounds of, the, of interaction, um, there exists a pro uh, some communication problem, two-party communication problem called L and K. Oops, uh, that can be solved, uh, if, you, if you give me k rounds, uh, you can solve this quite efficiently with just k log n bits, but if you're forced to use even one less round, k minus one rounds, uh, then it requires sort of exponentially more, more, more communication. Okay, so this is, a, this is kind of a foundational result in communication. Yeah. What is the Pardon? Did the Um. Mm, I'm not sure, actually. I don't know, but, um, this is deterministic, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe that's. Yeah. And the, and the problem is exactly what you would think. The problem for k equals two. The problem is exactly what Calvin's problem, which is so the, pro the problem is always a pointer jumping, problem, a bipartite pointer jumping problem. And Calvin was interested in the case k equals two. All right. Um, good. So so that's just to fill in a little bit of the background and teach you a little bit of classic literature. And then, okay, this slide I'm really gonna, not gonna spend any time on. So these are the theorems that say against adversarial noise, against random noise, you can actually achieve, you know, constant slowdown and, and 
these can go back. And we've seen that many times, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But it, the, the thing I want to say is this. So we're really concerned here. Um, so it's part of the time we've been concerned with randomized protocols, and that sort of goes back to 92. And then, um, and then um, there, there's sort of, OK, maybe we'll put it like this way. There's sort of two classes of approaches to these problems. One is based on hashing and checkpointing. It starts in 1982 and was brought to a very high level most recently by Halpler in, in 14. Um, and that's one sort of class of approaches, and it, it requires randomization. And if you want to go do things deterministically, which is really going to be my, sort of the, the focus and motivation now, um, then the, we sort of ultimately rely on, on tree codes one way or another. And tree codes were introduced in the first solution to this problem um, in conjunction with a particular simulation protocol, which uh, for those who were at Yale's talk yesterday, you sort of saw at, at the top level that simulation protocol being used. Um, but it turned out to my surprise in this wonderful paper by uh, Braverman and Rao in 2011 that uh, the tree codes in the simulation protocol um, separate. And you can use a completely different simulation protocol, like, you know, sort of writing on top of, of tree codes, which um, does much better for the error threshold. Um, so that's, that's maybe it for the kind of background. Uh, you know, uh, if this is literature that's been surveyed by Yael, certainly, and, and by Ron better than I. So, so let me skip directly now to tree codes. If there are no questions on history or Calvin or anything, I'll, I'll just kind of get us toward, toward tree codes, OK? Uh, I'm going to give the definition again, just to make absolutely sure that everybody in the room who may or may not have been at the previous talks has, has, the, uh, has the definition. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a stronger object than a block error correcting code. Um, stronger in the sense that if you have an explicit construction of tree codes, you can read off an ascent, uh, 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 a block code. Um, so a tree code is an infinite tree, which, uh, and it may as well be binary. The degree is really not important. The problem gets sort of easier as the degree gets larger. So, so let's just, we can just talk about binary. Um, the, uh, the vertices are labeled by uh, finite strings, sort of zero if you go to the left, one if you go to the right, and, and so forth. Um, and we're going to consider a tree as a metric space. So, um, but uh, we actually only care about the distance between vertices that are at the same level of the tree. And the distance is just the tree distance, so um, it's going to be the distance from the distance between x and y is the distance to the least common. Uh, to the least common ancestor, OK? Uh, so in this case, for these two vertices, their distance is 2. And now what we do with what such a tree is we label it. So we put at every vertex, uh, except for the root, at every vertex, we put a, a label from some finite alphabet. And then um, once we've done that, we uh, imagine sort of taking the conjunction as you run down a path. Conjunction of these characters gives you some kind of a word. And then we'll be interested in the Hamming distance. So, if, so here's the least common ancestor of x and y. We read one word going down this way. It would be the word bb. So a, the, the beginning point doesn't start, doesn't count. But So here would be the word bb. And uh, actually, I wrote it down, but probably shouldn't have. Um, so here you read the word bb. Here you read the word ca. And that, those have a particular Hamming distance, which in this case is 2. And we call this whole labeling a tree code if for every x and y that you take in the tree anywhere, um, this mapping preserves distances. Preserves. So, the, so it's a, sort of a uh, constant distortion uh, mapping from the tree distance into Hamming distance. Okay, So that's what it means to be a tree code. So there should be some constant c here, that's on the bottom left, that, re that represents the amount of distortion you're willing to, to tolerate. OK. So these things exist. There are three um, essentially distinct proofs of existence. Um, one, um, so maybe just I'll say them. I didn't write them down because I don't want to dwell on them. They're, they're pretty easy. Um, one is a simple kind of induction on depth. It's a, it's a nice argument, but it requires, uh, it's probably the simplest of all arguments, but it requires sort of a number of random bits that's quadratic in the depth. 
Then there's a very, very general argument that if you know the Logos local lemma, you can write down, you can just work it out. It requires a little bit the kind of, um, not the simplest form of the local lemma, but it's, it's quill, still pretty, pretty simple. Um, uh, and that, that proof, uh, I don't know if it's really helpful for anything except maybe regarding Sasha's question yesterday. So, so if you want to know that this infinite object is sort of constructible, in other words, you could keep building it and never have to go back, since we don't have explicit constructions yet, you know, you, that still counts as an interesting thing. So there's probably an argument that goes that way, but I, I think it's a question. I've never worked it out, so it's maybe an interesting question. Um, and then, in some sense, the most efficient ar construction argument is just that a random convolutional code uh, works with finite uh, probability. But, um, but we don't know how to verify, right? So I can you know, sort of toss one out, and then there's probably a half that's good, but we don't know how to verify. Um, and other talks in this workshop have focused and will focus on, on various relaxations. In particular, Ron mentioned these potent tree codes, which actually succeed with very high probability. They're a little bit weaker. They're sufficient for this application, uh, the coding theorem. They're a little bit weak. They're a little bit weaker, but still sufficient. And um, uh, those succeed with very high probability. So there are other objects. But the sort of curious thing about those, since I'm, this talk is eventually going to talk about like, you know, how are we going to build these things? Um, one of the interesting things is that I don't know any strategy of proof or construction that might give me a potent tree code that wouldn't just give me a tree code. And that gap is sort of interesting. The existence argument is not helpful because, um, you know, clearly just completely random coloring, labeling of all the, the vertices is, is, is sort of not anywhere. It, somehow it's actually further from the explicit construction than, let's say, the linear convolutional argument. So, so yes. Yeah, it just depends on the alphabet size and the, so you write down um, a desired constant C sort of for the distance, for the distortion, and then you, um, then for any probability success one half, I can give you an alphabet size that will be sufficient to, to succeed with that. And are these algorithms efficient or? Well, it's easy to write down the tree that you get that way. But you can't verify it. It takes you exponential time. The, in the, I've talked about this as an infinite object, but if you cut off, keep a, something of depth n. But, but, but you could potentially construct like, you know, a number of these objects and kind of run them in parallel, and you could discern that one of them is bigger than the other, right? Well, yeah, but that probably yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, if, if, you, if you give me an extra log n, if you give me a log n slowdown, there are, other, there are better ways of, of, okay. of getting where you need to go. There's a very simple, there's actually a very, very simple construction that's two decades old or so that's supposed to, where if you give me log n, I give you a completely constructive, based, you know, just, you know, use, use block codes as your, of various lengths as you're starting, and then you just glue them one to each other in parallel. And so I can, if you, I, I, I'm happy to show you that, but it's pretty simple. So the constant, what makes this problem really, really challenging is we want constants. We have constant alphabet size, constant distance, both of these things simultaneously. If you re kind of relax either of those, you, we, we know what to do. Other, uh, so I guess there's this, this notion of gravity, right? Yeah. Like right. So, um, yeah, so I haven't talked about, um, about uh, that. Yeah, so there, OK. Um, so I hadn't intended to do a tour. Of, Okay, so. What's that? Um, it's, okay, so that partly depends on what you define as exponential. So, uh, uh, you know, it's an E and X type of thing. But, so yeah, so I call still calling that exponential. And the, so there's a construction of, well, I'll just say what no one's referring to. There's a construction that takes time. For, for any epsilon greater than zero, you can construct these things in time two to the n to the epsilon, where but using an alphabet size that scales, I think like, I think it, I think it scales like um, O of one over epsilon. Um, so so you can sort of trade these parameters off if you like. That's the that's the that's the yeah. So. So one of the, 
Um, Okay, let me just finish this and maybe I'll editorialize after this. So just to, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page with me about what counts as an effective construction because even if you cut this off at depth end, it's a, sort of an exponentially large object. So what do I mean by effective construction? So I don't mean by effective construction what you would get from like a, lo a local limo type of algorithm that was sort of looking at the whole object, okay? What I mean by uh, an effective construction is what we need for the application, which is a, kind of a random access. So I give you some address. So for, for for you to have constructed a tree code for me means um, that if I tell you any address in the tree, it's this infinite object, your algorithm runs in time polynomial in, in that depth and gives me the label at that, at that vertex, okay? So that's, that's, that's what it means. Um, yeah, so it's been open for a while. Um, and, and we really, um, so, I would say that we haven't really made progress on this, this problem in, in any really. Did anybody try any kind of algebraic? Pardon? Did anybody try any kind of algebraic? Well, people have tried a lot of things. Um, and what I'll be showing you in, in a couple of minutes is the only suggestion I know of that's not obviously false. Um, and that, that's kind of the state of affairs, okay? So, so there are these, what we'll call elementary methods, um, the one I referred to a minute ago, for compromises, okay? So there are some elementary methods for compromises. This one was, um, which I mentioned just a second ago in the response, is saying gluing block codes together, you suffer a slowdown of one over log n, you, you get something. So it doesn't give this, but gives a, a lower rate. That's okay. Um, then you can get like weaker, I think it was being called like lo local tree codes or something where th this condition only works for vertices that are not too far away from each other, so you can, you can get that kind of compromise. I don't think either of those really counts as genuine progress. And the problem then is Braverman's idea, which I, I lump broadly into the same category of like elementary methods that are like the best we can do, but don't, I think, I don't see how they're getting us real traction on the final problem. For, for reasons I can maybe explain, explain more about. Um, um, but in all of these methods, I mean, why is there the one over epsilon here? Because all you're doing, let me say something about this. We have beautiful, you know, in combinatorics and theoretical computer science, we've made amazing progress in the last two or three decades on explicit constructions, you know? If you begin within the 80s, these, you know, the amazing constructions of, of expander graphs, um, which, of course, from those constructions, we've derived many other things, including like wonderful constructions of error correcting codes. Um, most recently, just like in the last year, we have a, a, amazing explicit constructions of, of Ramsey graphs, starting from um, extractors. You know, we really, you know, in, in, in a lot of these like deep problems, things have just changed completely in 20 or 30 years in this. And, and um, so on th this problem uh, sort of, sort of seems, to be, seems to be different. Um, and maybe one way of trying to illustrate that, and if, I talk, if we have time later, I can talk a little bit more about the Braverman idea and, and tell you essentially where the difference is, is for those people who know the zigzag product, you know, that's kind of a beautiful example where you can take some kind of a product of smaller objects, and for the larger objects still have the same quality of one of the one of the you know of the sort of the better of the, the two things that you're producting you know in this in this construction there's sort of, there's sort of no degradation and we can build big expander graphs through this kind of product and what I wish is that, is that the this this construction I referred to had that property but no actually it doesn't the you the this is supposed to be a sigma not an epsilon. Actually, this, this growth is, is because you're just concatenating things together really, rather than having a true, true product structure. So there's nothing here for this problem where we have a... a okay, so, um, so, okay, so I promised I'd, I'd, say, I'd say something about the best hope that I know of. So let me tell you first where this comes Before giving the actual construction, which is extremely simple, uh, I will... Uh, you start with the, like the background philosophy of how we would like to get a construction, and then I'll instantiate it. Um, so um, the kind of ingredients that you'd like to have is, is this. You would like to choose some your favorite compact metric space, and then you want to have two maps, two sort of you know, nice mappings on this space that are expanding. 
Okay, and since they're expanding, they're of course kind of have to wrap around and you know multiply cover uh, the image. But it's, these are mappings from from the space to itself. Yeah, maybe I didn't say that. Uh, so both F naught and F one are, are are sending M to itself. Um, so that's kind of one ingredient, and and we're going to want these mappings to be sort of quite different from each other. And um, then the other thing we need, and that we can have just because of no compactness, is uh, we want a del we want a cover of M by 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 uh, open sets of uh, each of them of some small diameter delta, and um, and then uh, we'll uh, essentially the the way we'll um, be labeling things is we're going to associate every point of this tree with a every vertex of the tree with a point in the metric space. And the label of the point will be just which of these sets B sub I does it, does it lie inside? And you break ties arbitrarily. Okay? So this is kind of where our coloring is coming from, but I haven't told you what the association between vertices and points is. So the, the idea is that um, every vertex corresponds to some point Px in, in your, in your uh, metric space. Um, by the following rule, so you, so you f first pick something for the root. root is it, the root is at some point p naught, and then um, and then um, if if vertex sort of x of the tree is is you know has associated with the point p x, then you know there are two children here, and the way you label them is uh, with the you know color. Uh, so the main thing is you you apply f naught to the point. Uh, Px, and you, here you apply F1 to the point Px, and then of course you you just color each of these vertices with you know whatever, as I said by this rule that you just you know which which of the sets B sub I uh, contains the point. Okay, so that's so this is a way of you know the key thing you have to have in mind when you're trying to build a tree code is that every vertex at a single level, no matter how deep down in this infinite object, at every level all the there has to be memory. You can never forget where you are in the tree. That's kind of the hard part of the problem. You never forget where you are. So the way we keep track of that is we have this, you know, infinite metric space M, and we keep we keep the full memory of where we are in the tree is is captured by that point. But we can't afford for that to be the label, so we we color by just the the neighborhood that you belong to. Okay. This is yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, of course with stochastic errors, that's not a problem. But for the adversarial thing, you, you have to do something like in your paper with, with Svika and Moni. That's not true. But I, yeah. I mean, But against an adversary, you're in trouble. That's right. Yeah. Is there any hope to try to construct it? So here's my question. A, is there any hope to try to construct a tree code that we can also decode efficiently? Because it seems to encode as much as your problem. And B, if we can't get there. But, but it, but it's 23 years old problem with Yeah. Uh, is like right. Yeah. No. So, so first of all, just a comment to that. Yes. Yeah, stochastic noise is not a problem and never has been. A, yeah. So, yeah. The question is again. So, so if you have an explicit tree code and the and any kind of stochastic noise, the the decoding is not a problem. The um, decoding is a problem against an adversary. The only way we know how to do that for block codes is with very nicely structured. You know, you can get, it's much easier to get a symptotically good block code than one that's also efficiently decodable. You read a lot of nice algebraic structure or a tree structure of some kind. So, I mean, so how do we do things there? We either have, you know, polynomials of bounded degree and such and such and such, and then, you know, a polynomial for the, for the weight, for the error uh, function. Um, so that would say that on top of all these requirements, we're going to need to add, make sure it has a nice algebraic structure. Or another class of things that are decodable are things, you know, if you think back to the, um, who's this due to, Luby and Spielman and so forth, these sort of expander-based codes with very uneven degrees. So there are, there, there's other classes of codes which sort of for not so much algebraic reasons we, we can decode. Yeah, so you would need more. Um, I agree. It's, Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. The problem is harder than I'm portraying, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so, um, so, just I, I, I want to keep, keep uh, convey the kind of the very, the very, the very broad intuition because then there'll be, this, you know, particular construct erasers here. There's this particular construction. I'm a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of a risk of getting too lost in the, in that one. Although it's not complicated, but. Um, and just to maybe, because it's an open problem, I'd like to really convey the, the, the kind of the, 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 what are we trying to accomplish here? So again, so we, we have some kind of manifold, compact manifold. We've sort of uh, got a cover of it. We've got these, these neighborhoods of sort of small diameter uh, um, uh, delta. And, and then we have this, these, these functions. And uh, these functions F0 and F1 that map a point, you know, P to some, to some other points, you know, that sort of label the children. And one thing just to point out is that these maps, why do I say these maps need to be expanding? They need to be expanding because if they're, if they're not expanding, I, I have my great big tree code and I eventually find two points over here just because of my counting argument, there'll be some two points, Px and Py, that are very close to each other in the space. Px and Py are very close to each other. If the map's not expanding, uh, if let's say if F naught was not expanding, I can just always go down to the take the path that just goes down by zeros, you know, to the left always from X and from Y, then I will have, you know, F naught may be sort of t sending them all around the manifold, but if it's not expanding, then these points are being carried around the manifold sort of together. Right? And so they'll start, they'll be colored together, the same color almost all the time, except they found except when they fall on two sides of the boundary. And so you eventually have a very bad distance condition between these two things. So it's a necessity that these maps be expanding and therefore, because it's a compact manifold, many to one. Um, but they also have to somehow not commute. They also are forbidden uh, from commuting with each other. So if there are any words in this, um, well, it's a little bit more delicate than that because uh, we require that they, not, that they not even commute, you know, in particular on, on the countable set that we're concerned with or the image of the initial point. So it's a little more subtle, but essentially we, it's, it's, a, um, we, it's very important that these things not commute. If they, if they did commute, uh, then you know, we'd come over here and over here and wind up at exactly the same point. But it's, it's even more than that. There's like a metric condition and we want them to not even commute sort of, we want to keep things far apart from each other as possible. So this is, um, anyway, that's the kind of general framework from which we would hope to derive these things. And I, uh, I guess I'm speaking about it because we have this, you know, sort of particular suggestion that will maybe flesh out, and maybe the suggestion works, or maybe it fails, but maybe the general strategy could, you know, maybe there's a more sophisticated thing that would, would carry it out. So this is a proposal that Chris Moore and I put forward uh, a year or two ago, a couple of years, yeah, um, and it's it's some. Um, some, something particular based on exponential sums. So, I don't know, if, if there are coding theorists here, <coughs> I think there are. Um, so exponential sums are used classically in coding theory, but usually in the context of the finite fields from which you are writing down a, blo a block code. Okay, so you're writing uh, codes over, over GF, uh, some PDN. And um, you want to understand the block and the the uh, weighting numerator. Sorry, and um, you know for this for this you need you know you're doing Fourier theory, so you're just looking at exponential sums. Um, so th those come up a lot. So I'm really just mentioning that for context because that's not what we're looking at here. Okay. So um, this is just to kind of make sure I don't get the wrong questions. So we're interested in exponential sums over um, z mod n over this over this this ring, okay? So, um, so let me tell you what an exponential sum is. So I, I want you to think of capital N as being exponentially large, um, uh, like the number of vertices at a level of, of the tree, some depth. Um, so here's the notation I need. Um, if X is an integer, E sub N of X is, is this. I, uh, I just take e to the 2 pi i x and divide by n, okay? So 
it's like using the the capital nth root of unity as as a as a generator. Um, and then the normalized exponential sum um, of well at a point m of a set S is this. I take the average over the sets over the points x in S of uh, en uh, of of m x. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, sort of a Fourier transform of a uniform superposition on this subset F. Okay. Now let's just think a little bit about the properties of, of this kind of this of this expression. Um, if you have an additive subgroup of this ring, of uh, the additive group of the ring, um, then you have the following kind of behavior of the exponential sums. For most m's, you get nice cancellation. Right, because you're you're just averaging over a subgroup, and m doesn't interact with the subgroup, then everything cancels out beautifully, and you get you get zero. We're going to want these things to be small, but um, there will always be some non-zero m's where uh, if so, m is a is a non-trivial subgroup. So if it was the, the full group, then this wouldn't happen. But otherwise, there will be um, sort of in the the dual group, if you will. There'll be uh, some non-zero m where you get perfect constructive interference, and the this mean uh, of the Fourier uh, coefficients is is one, um, and uh, that's gonna, that would be that kind of behavior is going to count as really bad news for us. Okay, if there's any m where you get this this constructive interference, it's going to be bad. Um, now, if a set in general, the phenomenon is that if a set doesn't have additive structure, so uh, an additive subgroup has as much additive structure as you as possible. If a set doesn't have such additive structure, then all of these um, uh, Fourier coefficients, uh, you know, corresponding to the value, values of m, they will uh, all all be small. You will see good, nice cancellation in all of those. That's the kind of general phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Pardon? N is going to be. It could be either way. I will, n could be prime or it could be, then if they were prime, this, these things wouldn't, examples wouldn't exist. I'm, but n, um, we'll actually be using composite, but, uh, but what, I, what I said makes sense, except you can't instantiate if, if, it, were, if it were prime. But you're going to construct evolution of poles, right? Pardon? Your goal is to construct evolutional poles. Well, this is not going to be convolutional in the same sense as the existence proof. So it's a little bit different from. Um, Okay, so what kind of sets S are we going to be interested in? So what I said on the previous slide makes sense for any, sense for any set S, but the type of sets we're, uh, sets S that we're going to be interested in this construction are what's called an incomplete sum over a, a, over a geometric uh, series. So let me tell you what's known about those. So, so a lot, these have been studied actually a lot um, in analytic number theory. Um, so for the moment, let me just quote an old theorem of uh, Korobov. So for this, for this case, I'll let capital N be prime, although it won't later be in the construction, but, but um, let capital N be prime, and G a primitive root uh, mod N. And um, then Korobov showed the following. Um, let's look at this, uh, this, for, this M Fourier coefficient of the uniform superposition on the subset. But the subset being right, all powers of G for, ranging from uh, little k equals zero up to some capital K. Okay, so you're summing over a, a you know, uh, you know, one G G squared G cubed, and so forth up to G to the you know capital K, um, and that's um that's not an additive kind of a series. That's a you know multiplicate or, or a geometric series. It's, it's, it's quite different. You you expect. You're, you can hope, and certainly for those of you who know about the sum product phenomenon, well, if you know about the sum product phenomenon, this is old news to you, but anyway, um, you sh it's true that multiplicative series like this behave very differently from additive series like the kind of counterexamples I gave you on the previous slide. And in fact, Korobov showed uh, this upper bound. He said, um, here's n to the 1 half, sort of upstairs. If the number of terms in your series is more than square root of, of, the, of the size of this, you know, of capital N, then this thing becomes uh, less than one, okay? And so you get progress. So, so when, the, when a geometric series is long enough, at least 
more than square root of the size of the ring, then all the Fourier coefficients of this geometric series are, are small. Okay, so this is a, a wonderful, wonderful phenomenon. Um, and it's been improved uh, with, you know, sort of, uh, there have been many, many iterations on this since then um, by, all right, let me not read off all the, all the literature. The, this, this one half has since then been improved. I, I, I know Bourguin Garayev was, makes it a one quarter, and I, I don't remember what's in the, in the last of these, but it's, it's, it's some positive number. So, so if you have a geometric series of this kind of polynomial length in capital N, you can get the kind of thing that we're going to wind up needing. Um, but we're going to need much shorter geometric series. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to forget about, for one, one slide, or maybe it's a slide and a half, I'm going to forget about tree codes, which are you know, what we really care about, and just show you the connection between this and, and coding theory. And so I'm going to put it in the kind of gentler situation and, and the closer situation to the, the Karbov style results um, by just talking about block codes. OK, so here's a, here's a way you could uh, try and construct a block code. Um, we are um, <coughs> we have a sequence of bits, right? Uh, so your input is this binary sequence length n. Um, and we are going to want to map this, this vector, this bit vector, to a vector of unit norm complex numbers. Okay, so, we're gonna, uh, so we're going to take you know, more, some constant factor we'd like more than n of unit norm real numbers. So it's some vector in C. It's some vector in C to the, to the CN, OK? Um, and, that, and, that, and the circle, so, 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 you know, so I'm going to map. So you know, I might have the, the pair 0, 1 as my input. And I'm going to map it to, uh, you know, I'm just to a sequence of you know, three complex numbers in the unit circle. OK, so this is, this is going to be kind of my encoding map. Um, and um, um, the circle S1 is, is later, for tree codes, going to be the manifold that we use for, for that kind of general strategy. But for the moment, you don't need to have that in mind. You can just look at it like this. Um, and the code is going to be defined, uh, the code that we define, you know, how, how am I going to make that mapping of bits to, to um, sequences of, of complex numbers as follows. Um, I'm actually going to let capital N be 2 to the little n. So instead of thinking of these as vectors of, 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 of numbers, I'm going to think of them as just encodings of integers between 0 and capital N minus 1. And the kth complex number in this mapping is the, um, this, um, is, the, is this complex number, is the, is a, the point on a geometric series. You sort of start the geometric series at, at the input value x, and then you take x times 3, and x times 9, and x times 27, and so forth. The, those, are the, um, those, are the, those are the those are the complex numbers that are in this mapping. Okay? So the, the code word lies in this product of circles. OK. So, um, why should this code word at beta, what, what do we want in coding theory? So we want beta x to be very different from beta x prime, for x different from x prime. Right? We want the patient to be far apart. And far apart, OK, now we're in a nice space. We're actually in some kind of a Hilbert space. So, um, so saying that they're far apart, of course, and, we, and these are not long vectors. They're all exactly the same length. They're all you know, on the unit circle, if you will. I mean, on the product of the unit circle. But I mean, they're all the same length. So, Asking that they be far apart is the same thing as asking that their inner product be small. Okay, so let's look at their inner product. What is their inner product? Um, so, and I'm normalizing, of course, taking the average. Um, it's just the sum from over the all the coordinates k from one to c n of this for a code, of of this of this term. So I take x minus x prime because when I take the inner product, I conjugate one of these terms, uh, three to k times the the difference. Okay, so this. This kind of a measure of how far apart point these points are has a really nice property. For one thing, it's not particular to every x and x prime. It actually only depends upon the, their difference as, as integers. OK? So as I said, this inner product is small if the two vectors are very different. And we can formalize this <coughs> um, um, as follows. So, so, um, 
the, by a kind of a rounding, okay, we're working in this on the circle, so you, you know, I haven't given you a label, a finite labeling yet, but I've already told you how we're supposed to get a labeling of these kinds of pictures. We're supposed to discretize by asking just what small, what delta neighborhood you belong in. So in fact, it's not at all hard to make formal that if this inner product is bounded below, bounded above, away from one, then you can round, then there's, a, then there's a sufficient granularity, as I said before, like then there exists an alphabet size, right? So there exists a sufficient uh, granularity where the, you, the code that you get from this would have hemming distance, um, the relative hemming distance bounded away from zero. Okay, so, this, so the strategy makes sense. Uh, you, you can from this read off, um, you can from this read off, um, you know, how you would in principle get a code, uh, but there's a, does that make sense to everyone? Just because I'm going to do tree codes in a minute, and things are going to be a little <laughs> slightly more complicated, so just it's be a good chance to. Um, but there's something missing. We don't actually even get a new class of block codes just yet from this, and it's a wonderful, you know, problem. Um, because you know, I quoted these bounds from all this history and analytic number theory, but they, as I said, they only kick in when your geometric series is of length polynomial and capital N. That's not our input size. Our input size is little n, is log of capital N. So we actually care about much, much, much shorter geometric series than these proofs apply to. Okay, we also need a weaker result. So we don't need, they give, they give that the normalized, you know, character sum is, you know, tending to zero. We don't care about that. We just care about being bounded away from one. But we do need much, much shorter sequences. So we need to sum, go from here not to n to the alpha, but to c times n. Um, and, uh, but if you could do that, it would, in, uh, you know, when the technology, you know, we're not close to there in technology, it seems, but it would, it would give a new class of block codes. But uh, this gives you some idea of how hard uh, uh, it might be to, to use this, and maybe motivation for using the general strategy, not with this particular construction. Yes? I have no idea. That's a, actually one question. Yeah, it's a very nice question. I mean, we, you're not going to be, okay. As I said, we're very far away. So, so the, the correct form of that question is um, uh, not what do we get from the theorem because we don't even have any. So you could, but you, I think a, I think a fruitful way of asking that would be, you know, suppose um, you dream up your, your beautiful world in which, you know, Mathematicians 500 years from now have kind of told us, you know, here's the truth. Uh, you know, what do you expect to see in these trade-offs? And and that's a wonderful question, which I, I don't know the answer. I was wondering about that a little bit. But uh, if you just make some experiments and draw this code on the standard, yeah, that would be diagram, yeah. fair, well above the, the So I haven't done. I haven't done that. Also, yes, yeah, so that's the short circuit. That's way to short, shortcut 500 years. So I, I haven't done it for this block codes thing. I have done it for the tree codes. And I'll show you a little bit later on what, what we know from. So it's actually a little bit harder to do that experiment for block codes than for tree codes because, um, I mean, these are very long computations. And so we can actually, for reasons that if I have time, I'll say later, we can actually go to much larger values of n with tree codes than with the block codes. So I've done the. So I've done those experiments and not these. Um, <coughs> okay, so now let me get to the main uh, show, which is how we would like to build tree codes from this kind of framework. So, um, uh, so we already, this is a little bit repeating what we had, so we're gonna map vertices of the tree, capital T is the tree to unit norm complex numbers, um, and then we'll round after that. So I won't talk about the rounding anymore. The rounding takes care of these finite alphabet things very easily. Um, the message M is going to be an infinite stream of uh, bits, x1, x2, and so forth. And now, similarly, we need to define an infinite stream of these complex numbers, beta naught, beta one, and so forth, um, all, each of which, of course, depends only on the preceding inputs. Um, and the, the metric property that we want is, uh, as, I, as we've said before, is this is just copying out the tree code condition, except, uh, well, actually, let's skip. This is the Hamming code, but we, what we want to get the Ham, what, what we need for the inner product, which, as I've said, is sufficient, is that the inner product between this vector, 
which is the encoding going, the sequence of complex numbers you see if you, you go down one way in the, in the tree. Um, and the inner product with, with going a different way and, and splitting, so there's some point in this history you do a zero here and a one here. That inner product should be um, bounded away from R plus S by omega of S. It should be ba linearly bounded away. So that's another way of saying exactly the condition that we need. Um, so um, so here's, a, here's an explicit construction, okay? So actually this slide contains all the information that you need if you um, don't want all the, the rest of the editorializing of the talk. You just want to see the proposal. Here it is. Um, so you, um, here's how we label the tree with complex numbers. You, you label the root one. And, um, and now given that you have a labeling for some vertex um, um, called x1 through x of k minus 1, I need to tell you what are the complex numbers of his two children. Um, so x1 up through x of k, where xk takes on 0 and 1. And the prescription is as follows, this is all you need to remember, is you cube the value at x, and you take its two square roots. Okay, so one of the children, so, so, the beta, so in this equation, beta k minus 1 is a constant. We already know it. That's the value at the parent. And uh, he has two children. Um, and they take on the values on the, on the unit circle that are the two square roots of, of the cube of the parent's label. Okay? So here, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, one has children 1 and minus 1. Let's go over here. Minus 1. So I, I cube it. It's still minus 1. And I get i and minus i. Uh, so up to, up to now, you haven't seen the effect of the cubing. But now you can finally see the effect. So, so this is <coughs> in, in um, it, it, when I cube i, I get uh, minus i. And then I take its two square roots, and I get 3 eighths and 7 eighths. Right? So the cubing here finally shows up. Because if I hadn't done the cubing, I, it would have had these children. Anyway, so this is the prescription. You do, you do this. You do this. Um, and in the language of this general kind of picture that I, tried, that I was sort of showing you before, the, mani the manifold we're looking at now is just, is just the unit circle. And the, the, the two mappings that we're taking are you take a point, you cube it as a complex number, which means you know, if you want to think in terms of the alpha, the angles, uh, you're tripling alpha, okay? And then you take, you know, F naught goes over here and F1 goes over here to the two. Actually, those are really not the square roots of this value. <laughs> Sorry. So if this was, uh, if this is beta and this is beta cubed, then somewhere over here is one of the values of beta to the three halves and somewhere over here, of course, is the other uh, beta to the three halves? Okay, so the, so F naught was sort of the mapping that took you from here to here, and F one is the mapping that took you from from here to here. Okay, so of course um, cubing is an expansive map. In fact, it's you know giving you a three to one cover of the circle by by itself. So it's nice, nicely expanding. Um, but uh, it's actually so uh, that was a little misleading. What I just said. So you're actually then taking a square root, but three halves is still bigger than one. So, so the kind of rate of expansion for each of f naught and f one is like a three halves kind of uh, expansion. But that's that's fine. Um, okay. So that's the kind of proposal. Um, um, so. Um, now, <coughs> if you'll notice, and actually the preceding example made this kind of convenient, if you notice the, the, the arguments that we see here, okay, so at every level, we're really looking at here, it's, it's like E sub 8 of 5 is another way of writing what I have here in terms of the notation. So down here, you have E sub 16 of some other odd number or something like that. Um, but you notice the denominators you know, are always these powers of 2 corresponding to whatever, whatever uh, level you're at. And 
Um, one kind of simple thing to see is that, in fact, you never get any duplications in the street. The, 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 the vertices at level n are always all of the two to the nth roots of unity. Okay, so that's simple to see, and it's, it's because when you uh, multiply by three modulo a power of two, well, three is always invertible. Modulo a power of two, that's a rather advanced fact in number theory. And um, so no information is lost by this cubing process. Um, but doubling is two to one. Okay, that's an equally advanced fact in number theory. And so the, the square root map, that's exactly why you get the branching, which we need for this, for, for this, for this structure. Okay, so, um, so now just for the heck of it, I'll, I'll try and give you, like, try and turn things on, the, on their head and show you the construction bottom up, if you will. So it's a little bit less natural because, you know, it's an infinite object, but nonetheless, because we know that, uh, we know that uh, it's still kind of a fruitful way of thinking of this. So if you start at some depth m, we know that all of the vertices there are labeled by these integers, all the integers between 0 and 2n minus 1, or, or really elements of the, the ring, z mod capital N. Um, but they're not, they're not showing up in order, and you saw that on the previous slide. So what order do they show up in? You know, who, who is a sibling of whom, and, 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 and so forth? So uh, the way to think about it is like this. If I have the index L, so the index is going to be this, this integer between 0 and capital N. If I have the index of L, let's look at who is his parent. His parent is the value 2L over 3. And, and, since, and uh, since, I mean, 3 was invertible, modulo 2 to the N, so that's fine. And uh, of course, this map multiplication by 2 is exactly why when you have two siblings, um, we have this 2 to 1 map from siblings to their, their parents. And he, that means, if you think about it, his sibling is exactly L plus 2 to the n minus 1. You go halfway around the cycle. Okay, so that's how, how uh, and, and <coughs> so the result of that is what you saw on the previous slide, is that in the left-hand sub half of the tree, left hand, you have all of the odd arguments. On the right hand, you have all of the evens. And that kind of pattern repeats. And the right way to formalize that is as follows. Um, Let's look at how, you know, what is the, if I, if I just tell you two labels, what's going to be their distance in the tree, right? We ought to be able to go back and forth. And so the way to go back is you say, if I have two labels, X and Y, um, the way we understand that is in terms of the two attic norm of their, their, dis, their difference. So you, you, you take these two labels, X and Y, subtract them, and ask what's the largest power of two that divides that, that difference, OK? That's going to be the tree distance, OK? so. Um, uh, that's why two, two siblings in the tree, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's n minus that. I, I, terrible. It's n minus that. That's why, so when you have two siblings, the largest power of two that divides that is as large as possible. It's you know, n minus one. And then you have your n minus n minus one, you get tree distance one. Okay, they're siblings. And when you go from the left hand side of the tree to the right hand side of the tree, uh, you get sort of the other extreme. Okay, so that's the some kind of a picture of what's happening here. Uh, how am I doing on time? I don't know how much to say about. Minus 10 minutes? You're kidding me. Wow, OK. We started a bit late, so we can give you more minutes. All right, let me see. I have to remember what I have to say here. Um, all right, let me just try and say these things more, more briefly. Um, the um, one nice property that this construction has um, is that you don't, it, it's a similar, it's the same nice property, but not exactly for the same reason that you have in the convolutional code construction, is that you only need to, if you, if you want to know what's the minimum distance between any two uh, uh, branching, it's enough, it, ha it has the same kind of thing you have in like linear codes, where you only need to compare to the leftmost path down the tree, okay? And that was because these distances only Dependent upon the difference between two, between you know, there's always just an x minus x prime in these expressions. So you can just move everything. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter what x and x prime are. It only matters what the difference is. So that's a, a nice property that helps helps um, in the analysis. And then um, the so the things that we are trying. So what we need to make this construction good is that these sums, which are are the what show up in the inner products. Right, so the m here would be that x minus x prime. Um, so we need to show that these, ex these, these exponential sums are bounded away from 1. Their real part is definitely less than 1. 
Um, and that needs to be true for all, for all odd m. And uh, the thing about this, so this seems to fall naturally into this uh, class of work on you know, exponential sums that I sort of quoted these results from. But I, I think it's really important to understand that there's, there's one essential difference between this and, and you know, everything that's been done in analytic number theory, which is that on the, in, the, in, the, in all those results I was quoting to you, the, the geometric series available to you is very long. Um, you can go polynomial length. You know, maybe you only get bounds beyond some polynomial length. But anyway, it's always available to, for you to just keep going. Um, here, that's simply not available to you. These, these series, they're of depth. They're of length, log base 2 of n, of capital N. There's no, because every time you multiply by 2, you're moving into a smaller and smaller subgroup, and eventually you just wind up at 0. And there's no point adding these terms anymore, and it's also irrelevant to the construction. So these are inherently, definitely logarithmic depth um, series. And they're also, they're just, they're just different. You know, in, in the previous work, um, almost without exception, the, the generator here, which here is 2 thirds, the generator is required to be relatively prime to, to the, to the um, size of the ring. Um, and there, there's some slight wiggle on that, but it's not, not substantial. So it's inherently different and I think uh, has not been studied. Um, so the conjecture, just to kind of have it on the board quickly, is that if you look at the, at the maximum over all m odd of this exponential sum, that that is bounded away from 1. So there's some infimum here. Delta spend here is the separation from 1 for any particular value of n, the worst separation for any value. Um, and uh, if this, uh, and then there's a lemma here, which I won't bother to say, which uh, deals with the rounding, which makes sure that everything goes through in this idea. So now back, uh, this is to Sasha's question. So we do have some numerical evidence that these conjecture is not crazy, although maybe it'll be 500 years, but it seems not to be crazy. Um, so the, so here's, um, so this is, a, I'll give you a more compelling plot in a second, but just, just to give you a picture. These are for a very small value, n equals 13. This is just a scatter plot of all of these normalized exponential sums, right? So the worst case would have been that one of these sums is out here at 1, right? So this is radius. This is the unit uh, disk. It could have been that one of these normalized exponential sums is up here, but actually every single one of these 2 to the 13 exponential sums lies in this nice um, scatter plot. The largest real part is around 0.6. That's misleadingly good. The things are not quite as good. Here's the best evidence. Here's the most thorough numerical evidence that I have. Um, so um, for reasons that I really, at this point, don't have time to describe, there's a very natural branch and bound algorithm, which is why the tree code checking is better than block code, you know, by which you can actually get the maximum of, um, so this goes out to 145, this goes out to 149. So you can get the maximum of 2 to the 149 numbers actually on you know, sort of a standard computer. Um, uh, uh, at least my, my students can. I, uh, I gave this as a branch of bound exercise in the algorithms class two years running, which is how I have all, the, all this data. They are very, I gave them unbounded credit. Like if they can compute this out to, I'll just keep thinking of more and more points. I set no bound. They were kind of shocked and the TAs were saying, no, you can't do that. And I, yeah, it's okay. I'll, it's, it's, I, I, I believe in exponentials. I'll give, so here's the numbers. Um, here, here's the maximum real part of an inner product recorded all the way out in two different years with, oh, so the, the red plot is with the, the scheme of um, multiplying by three and then dividing by two, which I described. You can take any odd number. So the next year I gave it with five. That's the blue plot. Okay. And they top out around 0 0.82 or something as far as these numbers go. Okay. Um, in the red plot, the blue plot, I don't remember what the number was. It's a little bit, a little bit better, it seems. Um, and then, um, and then um, there's a benchmarking of like, is this good or bad? I mean, honestly, um, it's hard to say from a plot like this. Like, you know, these are small numbers. I mean, they're hard for us, but they're, they're small numbers. So, what? So I wanted some kind of a benchmarking, and uh, um, and someone gave me a very nice, in retrospect, pretty obvious idea, which I had missed, which is, uh, why don't we just uh, compare this? I mean, 
the whole argument is that somehow the, the points in these code words are, look kind of like random points on the unit circle as you're going around. Geometric, this geometric series is giving you is if you pick, so why don't you just pick randomly and compare? So, and that you can actually do in pretty much enclosed form. You take the uh, n-fold convolution with itself of the uniform distribution on the, on the unit circle, and um, then so you've, you've convolved it with itself, so you have a nice central limit theorem, and you can ask where in that central limit theorem would be the last point of 2 to the 145 samples, or 2 to the n samples, right? So you can look for that, you can just use union bound, everything's nice closed form. That's this black curve, okay? So if we had the luxury of using completely, this is not really for the code, right? It makes no sense for the code, but it makes sense for the benchmarking of how random these things is. That's what this black line would give you, okay? So the, here we're kind of comparing to like ideal random construction. And it's remarkably close, kind of shockingly to my mind. So, to my mind, it's pretty good confirmation that these things are behaving as well as you could have. You couldn't have expected. Uh, anyway, you, let me just put it this way: you cannot expect to beat the black line. You know, um, so in one case, for some up to this number, we still are. That's probably eventually not true, but, but anyway, it's pretty good evidence. Of, although I, so I, maybe I should. Uh, uh, flash up the open, uh, okay, this is about the branch and bound. I won't talk about that. This is the open questions. And since we're way over time, I'll just stop and let you ask me open questions. 